Hi, I'm Toro Oliveira. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Utah, and I'd like to tell you about venomous cone snails. So you've heard about predators, and it's seldom that you think of a snail as a predator. You think of snails that are crawling around in your garden. But I'm going to tell you about a special group of snails called cone snails. And they are predators. And predators vary from those that use mechanical strategies, such as a great white shark. You have to be able to swim fast and have great teeth if you're a white shark. To predators that have a mixed mechanical and chemical strategy, such as the Komodo dragon, which has very strong jaws. But nevertheless, it has secretions that allow it to help capture its prey, to the cone snails, which are, in fact, predators as well. But they use a purely chemical strategy. And that makes them fairly unique as predators. So there are 700 different types of cone snails, species. And all of them are predatory. All of them are venomous. And each species has fairly specific prey. Some cone snails prey on fish, some cone snails prey on marine worms, and some cone snails prey on other snails. All of them live in the tropics, in the oceans, from very shallow water to really deep water. And the most uh, unusual kinds of uh, snails are those that hunt fish, because they not only are successful hunters of fish, but a few species are dangerous to man and can kill people. And Conus jargophus, which is the snail in the center, the large snail in the center, uh, kills people with a 70% fatality rate. So if you get stung by the snail and you have no medical uh, attention, you have a 70% pr probability of dying. Let me show you what the cone snails do to catch fish. So when a cone snail sniffs a fish, it extends its distensible proboscis, as you see here. And this particular species goes for a region of the fish called the lateral line, which has lots of nerves. And what you can see is the snail uh, beginning to approach the fish. And when it touches the skin of a fish, then from the proboscis out comes a uh, harpoon-like tooth, which is both harpoon and hypodermic needle. And so what you see is the tooth extended, and the venom flows from the proboscis to the tooth. And at the end of the tooth uh, is a hole, because it's hollow. And so when this tooth gets injected into a fish, the venom flows into the body of the fish. And at the same time, it's speared, because in fact, the end of the tooth is shaped like a harpoon. So once uh, the snail touches the skin of a fish, uh, it then can inject its venom. And the effects are what you're going to see here. It tethers the fish. And now it can draw the fish into its false mouth. And in this case, in about an hour and a half, it will regurgitate the scales and bones of the fish, as well as the one harpoon that it used for injecting the venom into the fish. And so what you can see is the fish is immobilized. And now the snail can completely engulf the fish in this false mouth. And a pre-digestion takes place so that all the hard parts get regurgitated, while the soft parts of the fish go further down uh, into the digestive tract. And what you can see is that the fish has very, very stiff fins. And that's one of the effects of the venom uh, to cause this so-called tetanic paralysis. All cone snails have the same venom apparatus. They have an organ filled with harpoons that are in various stages of assembly, which is a quiver-like organ. And when they go hunting, they move one of the harpoons to the tip of their proboscis. And they use it only once. And the venom is actually made in this long duct. And it's pushed out by the muscular bulb. And as a result, this is an efficient way to inject venom into the prey. So the snails, in effect, uh, have evolved the equivalent of disposable hypodermic needles for injecting 
uh, their venom into their prey. Here is another snail that, that's hunting uh, snails instead of fish, and it's going to inject its venom. And when it injects its venom, you can see that the behavior of the prey snail changes immediately. And so uh, because the venom has this effect on the snail, the snail can't move away. And at the same time, it can't go into its shell. And so now the predator can eat it at its leisure. What's interesting about snail hunting cones is they usually have to harpoon uh, their prey many times. And that's so that the muscles that attach the snail to the shell become relaxed and it's easier to pick out the snail. This shows you a video that really shows how fast the immobilization can be with a good strike. And this is real time, and you can see the fish is instantly immobilized. And this also shows you uh, an interesting thing that was completely unexpected. As the snail begins to engulf the fish, what you're going to see is that the fish, in fact, recovers. And so uh, sometimes the venom uh, is effective, but uh, there are lapses. And so you see the fish recovers there. In this case, of course, it has no biological effect because the, the snail has already completely engulfed the fish. But once in a while, we've seen these fish escape. Uh, and under those conditions, the snail always does a search for a paralyzed fish. Here's another strategy for catching fish. There's another group of cone snails. These guys, when they're close to a fish, they open their mouths. And this species, the tulip cone, has frills at the end of its mouth. And what they do is they always engulf the fish first. And only when they've engulfed the fish do they harpoon their prey. And so it's a different way of catching a fish. We call this the net strategy. So how do you study how these venoms act? And one of the ways to do it is to purify the different components of the venom. And you need an assay for that. So at the beginning of our work, we were interested in the components of the venom that potentially could kill people because they cause paralysis. And so our assay was to use mice. And what we would do is we would put mice upside down on a wire screen and inject different fractions of the venom. And some fractions had no effect at all, in fact, most fractions. But a few fractions caused the mouse to start to be paralyzed. And if it's paralyzed, it can't clench its paws and hang on to the wire screen, and so it would fall. And so what we did was we just characterized and purified those components that made a mouse fall. And that way, we isolated, using this assay, the first two components of the venom. And these are their structures. And we were surprised to find that the active components of the venom are like very small proteins called peptides. And so the first uh, peptide we isolated acts very much like cobra toxin or bungara toxin from snakes. And the second peptide we isolated acts very much like the deadly toxin that you have in puffer fish. Uh, and so when you get stung by one of these snails, these geography cones, uh, it's equivalent to being bitten by a cobra and eating a lethal dose of puffer fish at the same time. And these are the chemicals that really cause that. They're small proteins with the sequences that you can see here. Then our whole research outlook changed because a young undergraduate, 18-year-old kid, came into the lab and he said, you know, you guys have been injecting the mice directly uh, in their body cavity. I really think it would be better if you inject mice directly into their central nervous system. And I wasn't so persuaded by this. But the great thing about being at a university is the students do what they want. They don't necessarily prof uh, follow the professor's advice. And that really is the source of a lot of creativity uh, of the research in universities. And so what this kid found was that if he injected directly into the brain of a mouse, that he each component of the venom and each uh, peak here is one component of the venom caused a different kind of behavior in the mice. So while there were some components that paralyzed mice, others made them jump and twist as they're jumping. Uh, others made them uncoordinated. And this major peak uh, that I'm showing you here, uh, it put mice to sleep. And we were just amazed because the mice would go to sleep 
And 12 to 24 hours later, they'd be perfectly fine. Uh, but that was only true if the mice were under three weeks of age. If they were over three weeks of age, then instead of going to sleep, they would climb the sides of their cages, run from corner to corner. And then other peptides made mice drag their back legs or run around in circles or swing their heads back and forth or kick on their back and scratch or tremble or scratch or con convulse. And so the remarkable thing was all this stuff was found in one venom. And so that tells us that the venoms of these snails were extremely complex with lots and lots of bioactive things. And so we've been trying to figure this out ever since. So why are there so many peptides? And it turns out that some peptides are used to capture prey, some peptides are used to uh, defend themselves against predators, and some are to deter competitors. And so every species of cone snail has a set of biological interactions. And each species is different. So a different uh, cone of species would have different prey, different predators, and different competitors. Uh, in other words, each species has its own particular ecological niche. And so the venom components are essentially mutated as species evolve so that each is very fit for its own particular ecological niche. So the study of cone snails, and in specifically this one, led to the isolation of one of these venom components that turned out to have a use that we never expected. Today, that venom component is an approved drug for very severe pain. And so when your pain is so severe that even morphine doesn't help, then the component of this cone snail venom can help you in a lot of cases. So this was really unexpected that by studying this very seemingly esoteric group of snails, we were able to end up with a drug for pain that now is used by people in very severe pain. Thank you very much.